You know, we're, we're uh, preparing to really go into a study of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, a little bit, but I'm preparing a study guide for it uh, before we, we start, because uh, I want people to be able to follow uh, a kind of a simple study guide, what to look for, what are we trying to find in Luke's Gospel. But I like that one particularly because First of all, it's the most beautifully written because Luke was a medical doctor and very educated. And also Luke uh, tells us at the beginning that he did a lot of research and he talked to a lot of people before he wrote the gospel so he could know the whole story in detail. Luke came a little bit late uh, in the time of Christ's ministry and uh, so he asked people who had been there from the first, from the beginning. And that's why his gospel is the most complete and uh, of the three gospels by the evangelists. John's, of course, is a theological gospel. It's not really so much a history. But Luke gives us the history, and he's very careful about the history. So we'll have a study guide, I think, by next week for it. But there's one or two other things that I wanted to talk about, because <clears throat> I got an email from a Ukrainian uh, fellow and he was upset because in their church, the choir leader uh, did not want to sing the Cherubic hymn anymore, the Iji Kerubimli, because she didn't like it and she didn't understand it. So she started singing a Protestant song instead at, at that time. And it just makes one realize how little is ever taught to people about what the liturgy means and what goes on in the liturgy. The Cherubic hymn that we sing just before the, we come with the uh, holy gifts, is really the great anthem of the people of God. And it's an amazing hymn if you listen to it and what it says. I mean, it's why we should never have choirs, but everybody should sing together. Because the choir is like hiring mercenary soldiers to fight your battle for you. Uh, you hire somebody else to say your prayers for you and you don't feel a sense of unity or oneness in the church because the choir is doing everything and you're just sort of sitting or standing there doing nothing. And it's better, in the most ancient tradition, everybody in the church sang together. You didn't have some people that you paid money to sing for you. Uh, but the Cherubic hymn, if we think about Ije Kerubimi Taino, uh, let us who mystically represent the cherubim what it's actually saying is that we're actually standing in the heavenly kingdom when we're in church. And our Lord Jesus Christ is coming into our midst. He says, we are the angelic host. We become the cherubim in the liturgy. We become the angels in the liturgy. And that's why it's really such a great anthem for, for God's people. Let us who mystically represent the cherubim. And actually, uh, we're told by scripture that we're higher than the angels, the believers are faithful, that we're going to judge angels. So let us who mystically represent the cherubim and, and sing the thrice holy hymn, uh, because we know that before the throne of God, it says, tells us in, in the Old Testament that the angels stand singing, Syat, 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 Yospot, Sabaoh, holy, 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 Lord of hosts. And they uh, so, but all of a sudden, we become those angels, and we're standing before the throne of God, and we're singing the thrice holy hymn. So, in this moment, we realize that we're united together with the angels and with everyone who has departed this life before us in faith. We're all united together as one, and uh, so let us who mystically represent the cherubim and chant the thrice holy hymn. Put all of our earthly cares aside, because that, that's outside now. Put all of the earthly cares aside so you can focus and concentrate on the throne of the living God, upon Jesus Christ. So we put all of our cares aside, and then we receive the King of all who comes invisibly escorted by the angelic host. Because we know that our Lord Jesus Christ is coming into our midst at that time. And the faithful, of, uh, the faithful become one together with the heavenly kingdom. We become part of the heavenly kingdom. When we sing the thrice holy hymn, 
that's what we're confessing, that's what we're saying, that we are equal to the angels in heaven, standing before the throne of God. We put aside our earthly cares, singing the thrice holy hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy art thou, O God, shat, 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 gospel, and uh, so we're a type of the angelic hosts. And it's tragic to me that people really don't understand what they're saying sometimes or what the meaning of it is. And also tragic that the whole people of God, the whole faithful are not singing that. Because it's not about the choir, it's about the people who are in the church. And yet the choir is saying us and we and they're talking only about the choir. Uh, when, when you have a choir, they try to sing more elaborate music. But then it's not about prayer, it's about music. M music notes are not prayer, words are prayer. And when we focus on the words, sing them simple enough that everybody can sing and everybody can pay attention to the words that are being sung, then it becomes prayer. But when we're not focused on the words, it's not prayer. It's just entertainment. And sometimes the choirs work on being entertaining. You know, it's oh, such beautiful, our beautiful music. Uh, you know, they could be singing Ring Around the Rosie in, in, in uh, Italian four-part harmony, and it would sound beautiful. And some, uh, some people in old Russia used to call it the, the choir singing Italianstina, uh, in the Italian style. And really, it, it lost the whole content of, of prayer. Sometimes you distort and twist the words to make them fit the music. Yeah. And the words are, but then if it's an old Slavonic, I guess it doesn't matter because most people don't understand it anyway. Uh, I, I hear the, the going this, uh, sometimes the, the cherubim hymn should be sung with great majesty, with solemnity, very solemn. Sometimes they sing it like a, a Don Philip Sousa March or something in some places because people don't understand the words or what it means. So I, I want to explain just a few things uh, about the liturgy this time, and of course we'll take up Luke's Gospel next time, but I, uh, some of what happens in the church. I don't know how many of you ever read uh, the book of John's Apocalypse or Revelation, but think about the words of it for a moment. Here John says at the beginning, I looked and I saw the doors opening in the heavens, or the gates opening in the heavens. And this is what happens at the beginning of the liturgy. The altar is a type of paradise. You know, the Old Testament, the Holy of Holies, was put aside, and the Holy of Holies is where the presence of God came to the people. And it was all roped off by a curtain, and nobody could enter. The high priest could go in only one time in a year. And you know, they put a, a silk rope around his foot. If he died of a heart attack, nobody could go in to get him, so they would have to pull him out because it was the Holy of Holies. But it was a type of paradise. And that's why when Christ was crucified, the curtain tore apart and the holies opened because Christ was reopening the gates of paradise to mankind. Mm -hmm. So the, the curtain tore in half. And when we begin the liturgy, we open the doors, and then we see the priest. First of all, with the gospel, he's going to make the sign of the cross. Because the cross of Christ is the key that unlocks the doors of paradise. So when the doors open, you're looking into paradise. You're looking into the place where God is going to come physically into contact with man. And the gospel, we make the sign of the cross with the gospel, because the gospel is the road map back to paradise. And the sign of the cross, because the cross is the key that opens the gate. And you remember in the Old Testament, the, the five books, the Torah, they called it, were always kept in the altar. The rest of this was outside. So the gospel is the Christian Torah. This is our Torah. This is our book that tells us uh, about our salvation in paradise. And when we think about when we make the entrance with the gospel, 
because before the Torah was read, they always would go and take it from its holy place and carry it out into the midst of the people. And the Torah was wrapped in imperial raiment and with uh, semi-precious stones with the crown on top. And then you take the crown off, you take the semi-precious stones off, and it's wrapped in swaddling clothes like a babe, like an infant. So then you unwrap the, the scroll, and then it's read. And uh, the gospel is our Torah, so it's kept in the holy place. The epistles of the apostles is out here. It's not there. And uh, this, uh, so only the gospels are in, in the holy table. So when John looks through the open doors into heaven, first he sees Christ. He sees the Torah. He describes the Torah. It's uh, a type of Christ. It's with its semi-precious stones and its wrappings, royal wrappings and everything. So the Torah is uh, what he sees because the gospel didn't exist yet in the vision. And when we look in the first thing, we first see the gospel. And that's our type of Christ. And we see it with the gold of the semi-precious stones on it and everything. Just, as it, it, just like it's described in the book of Revelation, the apocalypse. But the next time, when we come to the symbol, uh, symbol veri, the symbol of faith, we always stand aside so you can see. And what do you see? What does Apostle John say? One like a lamb that was slain. Because the, the bread in the middle is called the lamb. And it's been cut in four ways. So we can divide it to, to give it to the people. But it's one like a lamb that was slain is what you see the second time. So what John is in the vision John is seeing the divine of the holy liturgy. That everything is about the liturgy. And that's why when he begins the revelation, he said, I was in the spirit of the Lord's day. The spirit of the Lord's day, meaning he was in the spirit of the divine liturgy, which was celebrated on, on Kiriakti on the Lord's day. So we see the, the symbol of it. So everything is there from the revelation. And what did he say? I saw the woman who had given birth to a child. That's why we have the Theotokos of the sign. It's always on the, this part of the church. Mm -hmm. we, we didn't manage to have the big one painted yet, but we have small. And uh, you know the, the Michael Borgia the, of the sign. And that's so important because Prophet Isaiah says that God will give you a sign that a virgin will conceive and bear a child. So the Theotokos of the sign in the first century catacomb, uh, you find that same icon. It's kind of drawn kind of crudely on the wall because they didn't have, you know, just little oil lamps and uh, they didn't have much to paint it with. The first century catacombs, it's already there in the arch of the catacomb. And uh, so everything is the way John describes it. And there's another important part to it. Uh, if you have any questions, just raise your hand at any time because it's better to stop and discuss something. But, you know, in the story about the creation of paradise, because remember the altar is paradise for us. Mm -hmm. In the story, there are two trees that grow in the garden. But those two trees are not real trees, it's a prophecy. Because remember that one tree was the knowledge of good and evil, and the other tree was the tree of life. So think about the two thieves who were crucified with Christ. The Razboidniki. On one side, the thief reviled Christ. On the other side, he started to mock Christ, but then suddenly he understood. So he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. At that moment, the cross of Jesus Christ became the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because this man recognized Christ as the good and then recognized himself for all of his own evil and wickedness and repented of it. So those two, and then 
The minute he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom, the cross of Christ became the tree of life for him. And even now when we see Christ on the cross and we realize that he is the good, that he's being crucified because of his pure, unselfish love for us, which is the highest good, that Jesus Christ has a co-suffering, pure love for each one of us and all of us together. And that's why he's nailed on the cross with his arms outstretched to embrace everyone to himself. And at that moment, we see him on the cross and realize he's the good. Not just good, but the good itself. And then we realize how far we're removed from that. So the cross of Christ becomes the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for us. And then when we repent and turn to Jesus Christ, the, tree of the, the cross becomes the tree of life for us. So if this is paradise, this is the tree of life. Because from this we're going to receive our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ is going to be present physically in our midst by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we receive the fruit of the tree of life because Jesus Christ is the fruit of the tree of life. And Jesus Christ is our life and in whom we have our life. So when we receive Holy Communion, we're receiving the fruit of the tree of life itself, for everlasting life. And so the chalice becomes the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, in paradise. So the altar is always to be seen as a type of paradise. And the holy table is both the tomb of Christ and the throne of Christ, both. And uh, so all of this, all of this is revealed to us in the divine liturgy and in the things we do in the divine liturgy in it. Even when we come out with the chalice and discourse, you know, the gifts, and we encompass the whole people, because we're, everybody's invited into paradise. So we don't stay up here, we go around the whole people. It's a tradition in the Orthodox Church. Some places they don't do it anymore, it's very sad. But this is a tradition to go around the whole congregation and say, you're all being encircled now by, by the grace and, and blessing of Jesus Christ. And you're all being invited into paradise to partake of the tree of life. And that's why we, we do. Um, when we have the, even with the holy censer, you know, we always say, and even in the Old Testament, they said the charcoal is a type of the pillar of fire that guided Israel when they were fleeing from Egypt, you know. At nighttime they saw a pillar of fire, and in the daytime a cloud of smoke that led them. This was, of course, the Holy Spirit. So when we have the censer, you see the cloud of smoke, the type of the Holy Spirit, and the pillar of fire and the uh, charcoal, and then the sweet smell of, of the grace of God. So sensing the church because the grace of God pours out on all mankind on the whole earth, but it also circles us. And like uh, Moses, following the, the cloud and the pillar of fire out of bondage, back into freedom. So the sensor, when we incense the church, it's our call. It, come forth out of bondage to the world and to Satan and come into the freedom of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the incensing means, that's what it's telling you. And uh, we come back into the altar with the censer, saying, yes, you're all invited into paradise. So uh, when we depart this life of paradise, the gate is open for us already, for us to pass into paradise. say more and more, but sometimes it will become confusing if we say too much. So, let's see. Uh, sorry? When was the, was the mother of God's icon uh, introduced in the altar? Was it from the early centuries? When the uh, well, certainly by the first century catacombs. The earliest example of it we find are in the catacombs in Rome, I mean that are still existing. But the reason it became so important is because especially for the Jews, is that God himself will give you a sign that a virgin will conceive and bear a child. So the Theotokos of the sign always shows Christ in the womb of the virgin, but giving the blessing also. And that was a part of preaching the gospel, was to say, yes, this sign has been given. Now, this is the Messiah. So that's why it dominated, it was the first. 
If you look at a proper canonical icon of, of uh, Nativity of Christ, Prachun, uh, the Virgin always dominates the scene. You think, why does Christ dominate the scene? Because this is the sign that a Virgin will conceive and bear a child. This is a sign that lets you know the Messiah has truly come. So she is she's the revelation, according to Prophet Isaiah. And that's why it, it kind of dominates it. But it's one of the earliest of all the uh, icons that we have. And simply because people wanted to depict the fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah. And so that's when we started to venerate the Mother Mary, right? Ever since from the first century? Well, yeah, from the first century when, when uh, people would ask, you know, they would say, well, here's the prophecy, you know, that a virgin will conceive and bear a child, so Mary is the sign that's given so that we know that the Messiah has truly been born. So it became very Im important in the very first century. Uh, yeah. Anybody else have a question? I, I know sometimes we, we, if we go too far in talking, then we, we lose people in the details. <laughs> but uh, it, just that to give an understanding of what the cherubic hymn means, what our place in the liturgy is, and what our place is that we're before the throne of God with paradise is open. The idea of closing the royal doors during the liturgy, except for the priest communion, um, that came probably after Peter the first, because uh, they used it to designate the rank of the priest who was serving and didn't have any meaning at all. But the, the door should never be closed except perhaps for the priest communion. I wouldn't close them at all except Bloody Kibberlam likes to have them closed for the priest communion. <laughs> so, um, but really they should be open. You open it, that's it. Open for the whole liturgy. And the more the people participate, the more the people are a part of it, the more vital, more vivid it is, the more it sinks into your heart, the more it opens your mind and your spirit to what's actually going on. You should never be spectators in a liturgy, because liturgy means the work of the people. It's a concelebration between the royal priesthood and the ordained priest. Remember, you're a royal priesthood. <laughs> and uh, that it completes the fullness of the liturgy when you're actually participating and being a part of it. So to sing, to say the prayers together, uh, even in the hymnals, we have the priest prayers, so you can read them in the hymnal, because they're, they're your prayers also, they're important. Um, and when you don't realize how important and how what the real role of the lay people is in the, in the worship service, it, it's less. You, you make it less than it is. You sort of downplay the, the, the liturgy itself. So it's important for us to know. You know why the gospel is read here, between the first coming of Jesus Christ and the second coming of Jesus Christ, the gospel is proclaimed to the world. So that the icon of the incarnation of God, the first coming of Christ, and the icon of the second coming of Christ, and between the first and the second coming of Christ, the gospel is proclaimed. That's why it's read here and why the sermon is given here, uh, the presiding, because between the two comings of Christ, there it is. So there's nothing here that's here without a purpose or a reason or a revelation. Everything has purpose, it has reason, it has meaning, it has revelation in the liturgy. So we have to learn it, even if only little by little, that um, uh, what it means and try to try sometimes to focus on what things in the liturgy mean. Mm -hmm. And above all, when you're here, pick up the book, hymnal and sing together with people. It has no meaning if somebody says, I don't sing very well. I said, so what? Christ is receiving what's in your heart, not what's on your tongue. And, uh, you know, if you sing and you say the words from the heart, it's a joyful noise before the Lord, no matter whether you can sing or carry a tune or not. It's still a joyful noise before the Lord. So, you know, that's, that participation and being a part of it is so, so important for us. Uh, that's how we that's how we become more fully a part of the life of Christ. I think sometimes some of the weakness in, in practices in the Orthodox Church are that people have become observers and not participants in it. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the uh, other part that we don't understand exactly what it is we're doing. 
But you know, with younger people especially, it's very hard for just to stand and watch a ritual going on and not participate, not be part of it. So the more we are part of it, the better it is, and the better it will be, the more fulfilling for the youth of the church, the young people. Um, even though between 15 and maybe 25, they're not going to be terribly interested because there's too much going on inside them at the time. Uh, you know, their, their mind's developing, there's too much going on, all their hormones are running around doing stuff, and uh, it's very difficult. But the more that it's a part of their lives, the more that they become a part of it. And also the more that uh, the more that they feel a part of a community, that they can identify as part of an actual community, the better it is. And very often that doesn't happen. Uh, I mean, I know uh, some parishes where a teenager have never talked to the priest ever, and probably couldn't without a special appointment or something. And um, that, that um, to understand ourselves, you know, so if somebody asks us, we have some idea of what's going on. You know, this is, uh, this is important. So, anyway, I don't want to say too much more unless anybody has questions to ask about it. So. And then next week, again, as I say, we'll have the study guide for the Gospel of Luke. And I think it's, for us, the most important Gospel of all. And uh, partly because, you know, Luke was at, at toward the end of Christ's ministry, Luke was there, but the people had been there from the very beginning. He asked if he has conversations with the, the, with the Bogorodica, with the Mother of God. He has conversations with the Apostle James and the other Apostles who are still in Jerusalem. And then he writes down. But some people had already tried to write down things about the life of Christ. And he tells us that a lot of people have written something, but I want to examine it carefully. Um, at the time he wrote the Gospel, Paul was in prison in Caesarea. Remember, Paul went into Jerusalem at, on the feast, and somebody started the rumor that he took Gentiles, Greeks, into the holy place. So they slammed the doors, and then they started beating on Paul, beating him up. And uh, one of the Roman soldiers comes down and saves him and finds out that Paul's a Roman citizen. So he's taken and placed under arrest in Caesarea until they decide what to do with him. So Luke is accompanying him, so he takes his time and he starts to go around and find everybody he could who knew Christ, who walked with Christ, who saw him after the resurrection. And then he writes the gospel, uh, carefully doing all the research for it too. And that's why it's, uh, it's especially the most complete gospel, of course. And uh, we'll start on the next week. So if you read the gospel of Luke and you have any questions about it, you know, uh, ask, write them down. Mm -hmm. And if you have any questions about anything we do in the liturgy, also, if you write it down, mm -hmm. also. Or the, the uh, Panikidas, the Parasas. Mm -hmm. You know, why do we serve the Parasas? You know? um, and what, what does it actually mean in it? So, all of these things, we should try our best to know and understand what, what's going on and what we're doing and participating. Yes, it really means to call the mass, that they are talking to the rest of the mother and the mother of our God, more honor of them the cherubim, and beyond compare more glorious than the seraphim. Without corruption thou gave us birth to God the word, truth thou talk, O we magnify thee. God is with us by his grace, and love for mankind, all upon the earth, and our